So up until this point, if you've been wanting to replace the stock mainboard in your 3D printer with a 32-bit mainboard from Big Tree Tech, you've had two main options. On the one hand, you have the SKR Mini E3 line, and that is a drop-in replacement for most Creality 3D printers. It fits the same mounting holes. It has all of the usual inputs and outputs you're going to need. Like I said, it's a 32-bit board, and it has four TMC2209 steppers right on board. Now, unfortunately though, that doesn't leave you with any expansion. You can't add an additional extruder. And on something like the Ender 5 Plus here, you can't separate out your Z-axis onto separate steppers. That's where the SKR V1.4 Turbo came in. Now with that board, you get five replaceable stepper drivers, so you can put five TMC 2209s in there. And again, that gives you that extra expansion for the separate Zs or for that extra extruder you've been looking for. Now, unfortunately with that board, that's not a drop-in replacement. That is a larger board that has to have special mounting, potentially have extra holes cut into your chassis. It's a lot more work for what you get. Now, if you wanna know more about either of those, I'll put it right up here. I have a link to where I've actually shown already how to install those two boards so that you can see the differences. But today we're talking about the hybrid of those two boards where Big Tree Tech has heard you. They know that you like the features of the V1.4, but you want the form factor of that mini E3 line. And that's why today we have the SKR E3 Turbo, which like I said, is just about the perfect hybrid of the two boards that I've mentioned. This one is still a 32-bit board, but now we have five TMC 2209s on board, as well as a host of other features that I'm gonna be covering right here in this video. And that's what I'm doing here today on Curzy Fabrications. Let's go. So in this video, I'm gonna do my usual thing where I walk you through the features and details of the board. I'm gonna walk you through the pinout diagram of the board for those installing it on just about any printer. I'm gonna show you the installation of it on my Creality Ender 5 Plus as an example. Then I will walk you through the firmware steps in case you're configuring this for yourself. I'll just be providing a few tips and tricks to get you started. And then of course, I'm going to do some test prints and give you my final thoughts on this new main board. So let's get started. So first of all, I'm gonna pop up here on the screen a few of the features that they wanted to highlight when they released this board. And let me talk about a couple of them. So first of all, this is a hybrid of the SKR V1.4 Turbo and the SKR Mini line, taking almost all of the features of the Turbo and putting it in a much smaller package with the correct hole alignment for most Creality printers. Now beyond the features that we're gonna be talking about in a minute, which I have on the table, I wanted to point out that they added a lot of protection on this board. I know people have complained on the various boards that it was fairly easy to short out some of these boards using the USB or, or other inputs. You could pop something on the board. So they added protection for the thermistor. They also added protection for the USB port, which is a terrific thing to do, given the fact that you can't always control everything about the devices this is going to be hooking up to. And you also know that they added an onboard main board thermistor, which is going to give you the temperature at the board. And that's a nice thing to have in case you're worried that the chassis itself is getting too warm. The chassis being the place that the main board is going to be stored. Now let's switch over to my table that I've shown you in the previous videos, which compares a lot of the current offerings of the Big Tree Tech main boards. Now looking down this chart, you'll notice that this board has the same processor and the same flash because that's part of the processor as the V1.4 Turbo. This uses the LPC 1769 32-bit processor, which has a 512 kilobyte flash on board, which from everything I can see will hold pretty much anything in Marlin you're looking for, particularly for any of your standard printer configurations and considering the inputs and outputs available on the board. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, this has five TMC2209s on board. And of course that gives us support 
for that additional Z-stepper or an extra extruder if you've been looking to add that dual extruder configuration. Now, like the Mini E3, this board has two CNC fans plus one additional always on fan. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, CNC means that we can control the speed of that fan. We can control whether it's on or off in our firmware that will allow us to turn it on and off as needed rather than it being on all the time. Now, much like the Mini E3 line, they've added EEPROM to this board, which is a huge feature for me because I believe every printer board should have a dedicated EEPROM. If you're not familiar with EEPROM, that's where we can store the settings of the printer so that it's available each time we boot. Now, the alternative to that is usually using up part of our flash for it or even sticking those settings on an SD card, which means you lose it if you ever swap SD cards. And I've always hated both of those options. So it's good to see that the EEPROM has been brought over here. Just like the other two boards in this line, we have NeoPixel support if you've ever wanted to add lighting to your printer. And unlike the SKR Mini, They've also added I2C and UR expansion as outputs in case you had any extra peripherals that you wanted to add to your 3D printer that use those interfaces. Now, the last thing I want to mention, of course, is the price, which is down at the bottom of this chart. And you'll notice the Mini E3 version 2.0, according to Amazon pricing, is currently going for $45.99 as the time I compiled this chart. The E3 Turbo, the new board we're talking about today, is $52.99. So you're only talking about a difference of $7 for that extra stepper and the extra features. And the V1.4 Turbo will set you back $68.99 if you want to add five steppers to it. You may be able to get a little bit cheaper than that depending on who you find that has steppers and how they're bundling those steppers. But as you can see, the pricing of this board is way closer to the Mini E3 line, which makes this upgrade a bargain for that $7 price difference. And I have to say, as long as everything goes well with my installation and it performs just like the E3 Turbo, I have to say this is going to be a huge win from a price perspective. I really won't see any reason to go with that V1.4 Turbo unless you really want replaceable steppers or a couple of those other less used features that only certain people are going to care about. But anyway, I think it's about time to go ahead and move forward with our installation. Future Chris here with some information that's really going to come in handy if you get into the installation of this main board into the Ender 5 Plus, and that's that these two boards are not the same size. This is the SKR Mini E3 version 2.0, which I've installed previously. This is the new board, the SKR E3 Turbo. And if I line up the mounting holes, one thing you'll realize is that these two boards are not the same size. And that's really going to come into play down here on this edge, where we've got probably another half an inch, or I don't know, one centimeter, a little bit short of one centimeter. And as you can see, this is going to be longer than this one, and it's going to run into something. So I'm putting this here because I know not everyone will start the video and walk through the entire installation before they order something. So if you're ordering this for the Ender 5 Plus, if you're considering this for the Ender 5 Plus, please keep in mind right now that these two boards are not the same size, and as you see in the installation, this is going to present a problem. So, Future Chris here, cutting back to the main video. Now, before we do our installation, one thing I want to mention is it's important to save off some of your settings, and I'm going to show you that here on the screen just a little bit. You're going to want to bring up your printer in Pronterface or in your favorite terminal program in order to look at that M503 output. Now, that M503 output is going to show you the settings that are currently on your printer before you switch over to the new board. Now, some of the settings you're gonna to wanna to be looking for are your steps per millimeter on any of your access that may have changed, particularly your extruder steps per meter, because those typically aren't going to change or not going to change very much from board to board. That's more of a mechanical thing. The other thing you may wanna look at if you've done custom PID tuning on your printer, go ahead and grab those PID values so that you don't have to redo that unless you just want to. And then, of course, the last thing, on something like this 
printer where you've got a probe, you're going to have a Z offset and possibly X and Y offsets for that probe that you're going to want to save off as well. Otherwise, you're going to be starting from scratch for all of those. And I think this just is a much quicker way of, of hitting the ground running with your new board. So now it's time to switch over to the installation of this board. And first of all, before I show you specifically for the Ender 5 Plus, let me go ahead and get down close on the board with my pinout diagram and show you exactly what's on this board, where the pins are located, and how I walk through the pin layout when it's time for me to install the main board. So here we are with the board itself, and as you can see, it is a rather nice board, and they've done a good job laying everything out neatly. I think they've really learned over the years uh, better ways of laying out these boards because the newer ones definitely have a more polished look than their original products. If you look right here, they've done a good job of spacing out the TMC so that there's enough cooling around each of the chips. So here we have X, Y, you have two Zs if you want to double up on your Zs to run two extruders. And we're going to take a look in the minute at the actual pinout diagram so that you can see where all of these pins go. As you see, we have two fuses here for protections, and we have the main processor here in the center of the board. Now, one thing they also added to this board that they haven't had on other boards are these removable connectors to make installing these hot ends a lot easier. These come off. You can screw in your connectors and then these just pop back into the board for easy installation. So we're gonna be taking advantage of those when we install this board. So let's take a look at our pin out diagram. So this is the pin out diagram for this board. I'm gonna walk you through it like I've done the other boards in the past so that no matter which printer you're attaching this to, you have a good idea of where you're gonna plug things in. So as you can see here, Along the top of this, we have each of our stepper motors defined. These are the polarity of each of these motors in case you need to set up the pins specifically on your motors. Now down here along the bottom, these are the main uh, connectors that you're gonna be worried about for this installation. So down here, starting on the left, we have our main power, which is gonna go into the board, and that's right here. As you can see, the top will be our red pin. The bottom will be our black pin. So this is power and ground for this board. Now right here, we also have another power connector. Now this can go anywhere that needs 12 or 24 volt power. So this can be used, for example, for another fan, something like that that's gonna have constant power to it uh, with whatever the input voltage is to match. All right here we have our heat bed. We're gonna plug this in, whether we have this going to another MOSFET or whether we have it going directly to the heat bed that goes right here. And as you can see, anytime you see a number like this, instead of you know power or heat or ground or something like that, then that's going to mean that that is a controlled port that is going directly to the CPU uh, for control. So down here we have our two hot ends. So this is hot end zero, hot end one. As you can see with all three of these, on the left is going to be our red pin. So this is our live power. On the right is going to be our ground pin. And that matches up right here. See, you see plus and you see minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Uh, this SWD is for software debugging. You're not going to mess with that on any of our installations. Down here we have fan two. We're going to start there. Fan two is an always on fan. And as you can see right here, we have heat and ground. They're using heat to mean, you know, live power, 12 volt, 24 volt, whatever going into your main board. So right here we have fan zero and fan one. Now these two are the same. These are our CNC fans, meaning they're controlled by our firmware. So on the left, you're gonna have your plus, and on the right, you're gonna have your ground or your minus, so red and black typically. And as you can see, again, with these numbers right here, that means that those are going to the CPU for control. And that, if we were dealing with it in software ourselves and having to set up the board, those are the definitions for those pins. Right here, this is our TFT. So if we're using any sort of touch screen, any sort of display that uses the serial terminal, that's where that's going to plug in right here. So for example, on something like our TFT35, TFT50, TFT70, all of those which have that five pin black connector as well, those are going to plug in 
right here. This PS on right here is if you're using an external power supply. These are all of our end stops. And as you can see, all of the end stops are gonna have our negative or our black terminal on the left and on the right is going to be our signals to those. Right here, this is where our NeoPixels are gonna plug in. This is again, this is another power detection circuit right here. Again, we're not gonna use that in today's installation, but if you have uh, something that uses power detection, that's gonna go right there. Uh, right here, we have THB, TH0, TH1. Those are our thermistors, and this is our thermistor for the bed, our thermistor for our first hot end, and our thermistor for our second hot end. And these do not matter in terms of polarity because all this is is usually a resistance. So it's just the resistance across these pins. So this is non-polarized in any way. So moving up here, this is our Z probe. So if we are plugging in, for example, our BL touch, our BL touch is going to go right here. Now, of course, I've talked about this in the past. If you are using your BL Touch as an end stop, which we are on the Ender 5 Plus, I like to still use this Z stop for my BL Touch's black and white wire. It's just a personal preference. This is the way I set up my firmware. But you can set up that black and white wire down here as well. Again, it doesn't really matter. But if you download my firmware, we're gonna hook up that black and white wire right here. This expansion port one here is going to be typically for our display. In Marlin, we call this a CR10 display because it uses a single 10 pin port to go for our Marlin type text-based display, which is right here. This EEPROM right here, what this is actually is, is our I2C output. So if you have any external I2C peripherals, they're gonna go here. This auxiliary two right here, this is for external peripherals. Again, I believe this is our UART output that we talked about. And then again, right here, this is our USB port uh, that we've seen on our board. And that should be it for all of our main board connections. That should cover you to hook up almost anything you've got. Now, when I come uh, to the Z probe, I will show you which wire goes where when I'm hooking it to my BL Touch. So if you need to know more about the BL Touch hookup, then look for it uh, in a few minutes in this video. So let's get to installing this board in my system. First thing I need to do is install this. This is a new display that I'm gonna be hooking up here. I will not be using the default display again mainly because the default display does not have as much control as a Marlin display, which is what I want right here. It doesn't offer as many controls. So this is the same display mount that I used in my previous video. So if you haven't seen that, I'm obviously gonna include links so that you can go find out how I installed that. I'm gonna go through that quickly here, not going through all the details, but you will see me run through this quickly and then I will give you more details as we install the new board. So let's get the Ender 5 Plus open and get to installing. So from that point, as you can see, everything comes off really easily because everything's labeled. And you may have some glue that you have to pull off because they do hot glue most of this down. But other than that, everything should come out really easily. Now, when you pull out these two right here, these are your thermistors and they are not labeled. They do not put any one of these nice little yellow tabs on here. And so we actually are gonna have to label these ourselves. Otherwise we will get them backwards. This one right here, it says TB on the board. This is our thermistor for our bed. So what I do, and you can do this with tape, you can do this with whatever you've got. I just print out some little labels and I have one that says bed here. So I'm gonna put this one on that so I do not lose which one is my bed thermistor and which one is my hot end thermistor. Now this is a good thing to do if you are upgrading a printer that doesn't have any of these labeled, as you're pulling them off the board, you can label them to make sure again that you do not get any of these out of whack. So see that just says bed, so I will not lose that one. And then if I wanna be double safe, I have one labeled hot end 
that I can put on that one as well. And these are just off my label maker. Okay, tape that onto here. Now I have that one also labeled. That one didn't go quite as clean, but as you can see now those are labeled. Everything else in here is labeled except for the fans. Um, and this one, this three pin right here is your filament run out. This one here with the blue and yellow is your part cooling fan. And this one that's red and black is going to be your hot end fan. So those are all unique in some way that you can tell what they are. Now the rest of these I'm going to have to just unscrew to get the power out of the various places. So the reason, the way you can tell these apart as you're pulling these out, these right here are your thickest wires and these are your, going to be your main power to your board. Red of course on all of these, red is positive, black is negative. When we pull these out here, those will be coming this way. Now these are going to be difficult. Red, there you go. So there we have these two. Those are going to be coming this way. And this one right here. Notice it's a little thin wire. This is going to be for your bed because our bed here has its own MOSFET. So on this particular printer, the separate MOSFET has these polarized red and black that we need to pay attention to. And then the final ones, these are for your hot end power. And you can tell these, these are a special kind of wire. They are their own unique gauge. And there are two red ones that are identical and those are gonna to go to our hot end. So that's everything off of this board. Now for the next part of this, I'm gonna send you over to the video that I did on replacing these displays. I've also in that video talk about adding ferrules to our various connections like these. And I'm gonna be adding ferrules here as well to make these connections nicer, to make them safer. So if you wanna know more about that, follow the video link that is in the description and hopefully up here at the top as well. And go check out that video on replacing the display and adding ferrules. Now, unlike my previous Ender 5 Plus, my other one did not have one of these ground wires. And this ground wire, I think is for the chassis. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, it could be going to the display itself, but our display already has um, a ground going to it in the way of other power connections. So what I'm gonna do with this one, I'm gonna leave this one right here where it was underneath this screw. It's gonna be between the plastic and the case so that there's still connection for this ground wire right here. Sorry if this isn't the best angle, but I think you can see what I'm talking about. It's still going to be in that location. As I mentioned in my previous video, now we still have access to this USB port over here and we have access to our SD card, which is over here. So we are ready to go with this display. We can turn this back over. Now let's talk more about the board. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, all of these wires come out pretty easily. You may have to remove a little bit of hot glue, but that's it. And we've labeled the only two wires that are not unique in some way with either a tape or some sort of label that we've made. At this point, all of these connectors are out of here as well, and those are just screw connectors that are easy to remove when you lower these screws. Now, in this board, you'll find four screws. There's gonna be one here, one here, one here, and one here. So let's go ahead and pull those out. All right, we're done with this board now. We can put it off to the side. We're gonna to wanna to take all of those screws came out of this board. Now I'm gonna go ahead and as I mentioned before, I'm gonna put ferrules on some of these connectors to make them easier to insert and obviously to make them safer. There we go, all ferruled up. Let's install the board. So here's the new main board that I showed you before. Again, this is laid out the same way that the old board is. We've got our micro SD card slot here and our USB port there, so they're gonna go that way. And here are the four 
possibly five if you have it, but we don't have it in this case, screws for this board. So that's unexpected. So as you can see right here, this actually gets in the way of this mount. So that's not going to work. Huh. Completely unexpected. So I guess it's time to do an on the fly mod of this and cut this out a bit so that we can mount this like we're supposed to because this is not the drop-in solution that I was promised. And uh, this is definitely not what you want to see when you go to install it. It's definitely running into that. So, what are we going to do? I guess I'm going to be cutting off some of this. I'm going to cut down here. Go ahead and make sure I'm not cutting anything else. That should not be a problem. Let's just cut that PLA off right there. All right. And now we need to cut all the way along here. I think we can do these with these snips. Let's get the board out of our way so we don't damage anything. Okay. So it looks like I'm going to have to pull this out to do it, even though I don't want to, because that's not going to help. And we're probably going to have to cut off this uh, post anyway. So anyway, let's, let's do that. Okay, everything removed as I said. So now we're going to snip off this corner of this mount. And I'm glad no one was standing there. And that one. There we go. And... So technically we could use a new design on this mount, but this is where I went. Okay. So not the prettiest mod you've ever seen, but it will get us there and it will still be plenty secure. I believe because we are going to be sandwiching this in from both sides. There we go. And now, uh, believe it or not, we are going to have to get rid of this post because even without that there we still do not fit uh, we still won't get to our screw holes so that means uh, we're gonna have to bring out the dremel because i don't know of any other way that we're getting that post out so dremel time okay so i'm ready to dremel first thing you'll notice is that i have taped up everything you can't really see it here but i did tape up my power supply all of the holes here the fan holes and everything are covered up i don't want any shavings in the power supply i've also covered up my mosfet i could have just removed it so i had to just cover it up with tape so that we again don't get metal shavings metal bits in this area and then after i'm done i'm going to take a can of compressed air make sure i clean everything out before i remove the tape and let's see if i can get this screw post off so that it will be out of the way for our installation i've got a Dremel tool here. I have a reinforced cutoff wheel as you can see and I am wearing the proper eye protection in order to make sure that none of these bits get into my face. So I'm going to see what the proper angle is here. I may have to turn it around and the view may not be great but I'm going to cut this off of here. I have about 20,000 RPMs. I don't know if that's a hundred percent the best speed to do this at but I'm going to find out. There we go, 20,000 RPM seem to have done the trick because I no longer have, uh, and I'm sure that's hot, but anyway, because I no longer have a post in my way. So there we go. I'm going to, again, let's clean this out with some compressed air. All right, that should be good. Now we can remove all of our tape. Trust me, the wasted tape is well worth it here because we do not want this in our electronics. That was pretty clean. 
let's see now if the board fits the way it's supposed to. Here's the board, there's the connections. They get all of our wires out of the way. As you can see now, everything matches up. This is not gonna hit anything. I can reinstall my display now and get back to where I was before this mess. So we'll see if removing that post somehow interferes with this mounting correctly or it being mounted stably so that we don't get any wiggle on that display. We'll find that out when I get everything reinstalled. But as you can see, cutting that off does fix the problem. So a little bit closer for board installation here. And as you can see, this is all ready to go. I went ahead, finished cutting all of this off, made sure that it was not sharp so that it wouldn't cut me while I was messing around in here. But that's all it took. I cut it here, cut it here. And of course you saw me cut off that screw post right there. So let's go ahead, let's see if our board fits now. So we're gonna take it, it goes in this way because of course we have to line up our USB and micro SD card. And that should go right in there. And as you can see, it does. And our screw holes are lining up and we still have room to plug everything in. So this looks good. And one thing I also wanted to show you and we can see this from the top as well. This is still extremely secure. By removing this peg, I haven't removed any of the rigidness of this display mount. It still feels really good. So I'm happy to see that. And this is a still an easier mod to do, of course than the SKR 1.4 turbo mod that we had to do before. So let's go ahead, we're gonna go ahead and screw in this main board and then we'll be ready for wiring. Okay, everything is in there now. So now we can come in here and go ahead and start reconnecting everything back up. So anytime I do this, I always have my wiring diagram close by, the one we just went over, and I will orient it to face the direction that I have the board installed. Now this makes it a lot easier to figure out where everything needs to be plugged in. So first of all, let's go ahead and do everything on this side of the board first because obviously we don't want to be having to fool with these to try to get under here. So we've got this corner. Now this corner over here is where our thermistors go. So this one is the hot end thermistor right here, hot end thermistor goes right here into this one. Again, polarity on these don't matter, so it doesn't matter which way you plug these in. The bed thermistor goes right here. Next up on the board is the Z end stop. So I've talked about it before. When doing my end stop for the BL touch, you could obviously put it in with the probe, which would be in this area but I have always preferred that if you're using the BL Touch as an end stop, I do like to put that into the actual Z end stop position. As you can see, I've got black and white. Let's see which the orientation it's supposed to go on. Now this is backwards on my board. On my diagram, I have ground on what will be the right on the camera and the white should be on the left. So I'm gonna have to swap these around. That means that I need to get a small screwdriver to put in here so that I can swap these around. So here we are, I have the smallest screwdriver tip I had in my set. Uh, this may be too small, but it also might work pretty well. I'm going to push that in here. That should allow me to pull the black one out. So thanks to a little bit of overzealous glue, I was just forced to do one of the least favorite things uh, that I like to do in all of electronics, and that was to put new connectors on this cable. Uh, basically, there was so much glue in this that I was unable to get these out without breaking the wires off of the connectors. So anyway, side story, I just had to put new connectors on there and it sucked. So right now, let's go ahead and do this the right way. So this is going to go in here like this. And if that goes in here like this, the ground is on my right. And then the signal is going to go on my left. And I hope there's not still too much glue in there. I can't get any more out. And it looks like there is, so I guess I'm stuck pulling more glue out of that holder. I might just cut some out at this point. I'm about tired of it. Let's try again. All right, so signal goes on this side. There we go. So black and white are in there just like it's supposed to be. Let's move these all out of the way. I want to move this back over so you can see what I'm doing. And then that means that 
white will be on our left and ground will be on our right. And that plugs in there. Okay, next up is the Y end stop, which should be labeled nicely for us. These are these two pin wires here. So you see this one says Y. That's going to go next down here. Again, unlike the BL Touch, these don't have a left and a right, so we don't have to worry about them. And notice that one says X right there, so that will go in here next. Okay, so all that bottom row is now filled in. Now let's go ahead and we can move to our screw-in connectors. Now, as I mentioned before, these come out now. So what we have here, this is hot end one, this is hot end zero, so we're gonna pull out hot, hot end zero. So here is our connector, as you can see right there. This has two screws here. We're gonna stick our terminals in there and then we can tighten those down and then we can just add this in here. So what we're looking for are the two red ones that we put ferrules on before and hopefully there's a little bit of give here. If not, you're gonna to have to pull it from the outside and push it in just a little bit and shorten that cable, but these should reach. Now again, there's no particular polarity on the hot end ones. I'm going to put one here. I'm going to put one here. Let's see, are those actually already down? No, they're not down yet. So that's the first thing we have to do is let them down. Let me show you what this looks like as we're doing this. As you can see there, it comes down, it opens up. Same thing with this one. Okay, so now that we've got those down, they're ready to receive the ferrules. We'll get those pushed in here. There we go. There's one. And. Here's the other one. Okay, now we'll just tighten those down. And you can tighten these down pretty good with the ferrules on them because that's actually going to crimp them further onto the wire. You don't really have to worry about it. And once that's in there, as I mentioned, these just pull in and out of here. So once we snap that back down, that is all set. So next up here we have the bed and we have an extra power connector and then we actually have the power for the board. So right here is the bed and according to this you can see right here it's negative and positive. So negative is going to be our left, positive is going to be on our right. We need to keep looking at this as we go in case any time they decide to change them on us. So just as before we need to drop down these connectors. Once they're dropped down we can put our ferrules in those slots. So we're going to put negative on this side and tighten it down. Okay. Then we can take positive on this side and tighten it down. Now for this installation, we're not going to be using this extra power for anything. Now, if you had an extra fan somewhere that you wanted to use, you could plug that in there, anything else that might need 24 volts, or if you just wanted to come off your board with anything. And then right here, we have the main power for the board. And according to this, it's going to be our positive on the left and our negative on the right or I should say positive on this end negative on this end so again just as before let's lower those down lower that down okay we can put our positive on this side now these may have to come down a little bit further obviously because these ferrules are pretty big but I may have gotten it there let's find out I think that's on there Again, I'm going to tighten these down pretty good so that it will crimp that connector on there correctly. Put that one in there. There we go. You can see it come up there. And that one is also tightened in there. Well, I'm going to give all of these wires a little bit of a tug. Make sure everything is in there correctly. I think we've got it all. So now let's go to the next row of connectors. So next up is our E1 stop. But since we're not running a second extruder, we're not going to be using that. And then we have our E0 stop. So E0 stop is actually going to be our filament runout sensor. Now let's make sure that all of the wires are correct on this one. So according to this, it needs to be five volt here, ground in the center, and then signal. That's exactly what we have here. It's exactly the way it was wired on our previous stock board. So that should go straight in here without any problems. Next up, we have the PS on, which we will not be using. And then we have fan one. Now fan one, I have defined as our hot end fan. What that means is that this hot end will now be thermally controlled by the main board. So if the hot end ever gets above 50, the fan will turn on automatically rather than being on all the time and making noise when you don't need it to. So again, I'm gonna check polarity on this. I'm gonna make sure we have ground and we have heat as it calls it. 
So this one is correct. That's going to go right here. And then same thing on the next one. The next one is our fan zero. Fan zero is always going to be the part cooling fan. I'm gonna make sure that that's correct here. That is also correct in terms of the way the pinouts are. And that's going to go right here. So again, now both of these fans are going to be controlled by the firmware itself. So when they come on and off, will be controlled by the computer. Okay, so I went ahead and took the opportunity right now to go ahead and install these heat sinks because I wanted to make sure I did that before I moved on to these connectors. All you have to do is peel off these blue covers off of the heat sink tape off the back of these and then they will go on here. Again, I just did it now so that I didn't forget to do it before I covered everything up here. Now right now, let's go ahead and do the BL touch before I forget it as well. And notice the colors on here are orange, which is going to be signal for BL touch. Brown is ground and red is our power. So the brown and the red on here are swapped and we need to swap those around. Now this one's easier to do than the other connector because all you have to do is just barely pull up on these and then you can swap them. I'm not swapping the orange. I'm only swapping the red and the brown and we just pull up on that connector. So there the brown comes out, there we go, and then we pull out the red connector, okay, we're going to move that red connector to the center one, make sure you have your keys on the correct side so that they lock back in, and we'll put the brown on the end, and you should see those click in place and they should not pull back out easily. So again, we have brown, red, and orange, they're going to go in like this, and we're going to have to pull just a little bit on this one and it should go into this end of this connector right here. This is the Z-Probe connector. And hopefully, if you have a little bit, uh, you need to pull on these just a little bit, that's fine. You can pull on those and then you'll have a little bit of slack, just like that. So again, brown, red, orange. I would say that this connector and the black and white are the most common connector that I get complaints about, the BL Touch not working correctly. So make sure that this is oriented correctly. Again, this is on the far right of your screen. And this one had to be swapped around, at least on mine. Pay attention to the colors. If the colors are not right, then don't just swap them because I did. Anyway, make sure that those are seated well and we will be ready to go on to the next one. Now this is a good place to go ahead and also plug in your display. So the display, this 10 pin display, which will be for Marlin mode on the display, if you have this kind of display, and this is keyed and will only go in one direction. If you are following the, the same orientation of this cable I did, you should go in like this. Make sure you put a nice zip tie around there, and then you can get this out of the way just a bit so that you're not over these heat sinks if possible. Next up, we'll go and hook up our 10 pin connector as well. Now this extra pin here, you'll notice the connector. It's pretty standard. It's just a five pin connector, the four pin and the one pin. The one pin is our reset and is going to go here on the far right. So the rest of the pins go on the other four. And then we can put the reset in by itself on that last pin. Now that should be for the touch mode. So again, if you're having problems with Marlin mode, you're going to need to mess with this cable. If you're having problems with touch mode, it's going to be this cable. So that's just a friendly tip in case I've heard plenty of people say my touch mode isn't working and I tell them, please go check the orientation. Please make sure that this is seated correctly. After that, the only ones that should be left are the motors themselves. And we can look at the little IDs on the tags to find out where they go. So this one is X. This one is our first Z. So we will put that. It doesn't matter which one of these Z's you plug it into. They both go to the same stepper driver. So that's going to go there. We have our other Z. Now Z is going to go all the way down here into E1 because we do not have a second extruder. So that's going to go down there into E1. We have our Y. So Y is the second one. And then this, of course, will be E for our extruder. And that's going to go into E0 because it is our first and only extruder. Now after that, this should look pretty good. You can move these around a little bit if you want to. But overall, I think I'm happy with this layout. Everything should be plugged into the correct locations. Now, the only thing left, you'll notice that we still have our fan 
on our cover. And this is our controller fan. And I am going to plug that into what they call fan two. This point is very difficult to see because it's covered by a lot of wires in this area. But I can tell you that plus is going to go towards this, towards this direction. Minus is going to go towards that direction. And you'll need to just get right in here and that'll go right on there. There's not a socket for it. It'll just slide straight over the pins. But I think with all the wires in there and the connectors around it, there shouldn't be any problem with that coming undone. And then we can patch everything up. We can close the lid. We're ready to flip it over, give it a shot, see if it all comes on. So while I'm doing that, why don't you guys go ahead over to the computer, take a look at the changes that I needed to make on Marlin to get this board working. It's not gonna be an exhausted list. It's just going to be these components specific to this board. I'll show you what I did on my firmware. So here we are in front of my meld tool, which allows me to compare trees of code to see what's changed. On the left, I have my original 2.0.7.2 tree, which is the original one from Marlin. And on the right, I'm going to have the changes that I've made, particularly for this board and then particularly for my printer. So let's go through the three main files that you're going to change if you are making changes for a specific printer. So first of all, we have our platform.ini. You can see right there, this is in the root of the Marlin tree. And I have changed the default, which is just a Mega 2560, to an LPC 1769. Now this is the processor that you'll find on this new board. It's the same processor that you'll find on the V1.4 Turbo. And that's the only thing that we have to change in this file. Everything else is predefined in this file based upon this chip that we've chosen right here. Now going into configuration.h, let's take a look at the parts of the code that are specific to this board. Now, first of all, I always change the serial ports and I go by what Big Tree Tech usually has in their tree. So they have their two serial ports changed. First of all, the first serial port, which is just serial port, is changed to negative one. Serial port two is changed to zero. And as you can see, these are just flipped from the original values. Now they have a baud rate of 250,000. And I don't like to use that baud rate, and I'll tell you why. And it's mainly because I have some software that connects to the printer that does not have 250,000 as an option. That is a newer, higher standard than some software supports. So I set mine to 115200. That's going to be just fine for pretty much every application that you could have for your serial port. But again, that's just what I like to set mine to. Now the really important one, not that any of these are not important, but the really important one here is which motherboard you select. Notice the default one selected is this Ramps 1.4 board. And of course, we're gonna have to change that to our Big Tree Tech SKR E3 Turbo, which is defined in the latest trees. Now next up, as we move further down this file, you'll see you have your driver types. Now obviously on this board, we have five drivers and they are, soldered onto the board so they're not changeable so we're going to go ahead and set this the same on every installation and these are going to be set to the tmc 2209 for all five of these now the names of these may change depending on what you use that second stepper for so for my firmware for example i'm using that as a second z driver so z2 driver is defined as tmc 2209 now, if instead you were going to set that as your second extruder rather than a second Z driver, then you would undefine this right here, this E1 driver type, and set it to TMC2209, just like I did with this Z2 driver, which would be commented out in the case that you're using it as a second extruder instead of a second Z. Now, since we do have a board that has a built-on EEPROM, you're definitely going to want your EEPROM settings uh, able to be saved. So you're going to undefine this define EEPROM settings, which is right here, that will turn on that EEPROM and make it where you store those settings locally. We obviously have SD card support on this board, so that needs to be undefined. And the last thing you'll find in this particular file is the CR10 stock display. And what this is, is again, that's that 10 pin header that we use to go to the Marlin display and that will give us that text slash graphical display that we're also familiar with. Now we can go over to the configuration underscore ADV.h, 
which is also located in that Marlin directory, the same place that that last file was found. So the first thing I'm gonna be looking for in this file is what am I going to do with that fan one header that I'm using on the board? Now, as I mentioned, I'm using that to control whether the hot end fan turns on or off, and that's where this E0 auto fan pin comes in. Now that fan one pin is already predefined by our board as fan one underscore pin. So when it comes to this E0 auto fan pin, all I have to do is set that pin right here. Notice negative one would be disabled, which is what it's set to by default. And I'm just going to define it as fan one underscore pin. Now there are other settings down here that will control exactly how this works, but I left mine as defaults because the defaults are actually very sane and are good defaults. Let's see what's next in this file. So as I showed when I was setting things up, I am using that second stepper driver for my second Z stepper motor so that I can do some auto leveling. And you'll find that right here, the number of Z steppers I changed from one to two, that lets Marlin know that we are using that second, which would have been E1 stepper driver as a second Z stepper, and it knows what to do with that information. And to go along with that, lower down here you see in this file is that Z stepper auto align functionality right here, which I simply uncomment by removing these two slashes and that will turn on that feature which will now be available via the G34 command or via the display which will now have that option as well. And if you missed it, I did an entire video on G34 and I'll include a link hopefully up here at the top of the screen or in the description that you can find on this channel. Now, if you want to, you can also specify exactly where you want those Z-Stepper auto-aligned points to be on your bed, which is what I did right here, but that's up to you. You can try using the defaults if that works. Now, when using one of these Big Tree Tech boards with a Big Tree Tech display, you're going to have the option of which SD card slot do you want to do when loading code in your Marlin mode. So here's where we make that selection is you can use either LCD or on board. Notice that the default, if this is uncommented, is going to be LCD. Now I just like to use the one on board, it's the one I'm used to using and it's convenient for me. So I have it uncommented here and then I have selected on board, which will make it use that on board SD card slot for Marlin mode. Now while you're in this file, you may want to come down to this has trinamic config section to actually set the current for your stepper drivers. Now this is going to vary greatly depending on your printer and how much current you need to drive your different access. So you'll see here on my Ender 5 Plus, for example, that I need lower current than the default for both of my Z axis and my X axis, which I've lowered them to 650 milliamps but on the Y axis, for example, I left it at 800 because that's a heavier axis and that does require a little bit more to move without losing steps. So visit this section if you think you need to lower those or raise those up depending on your printer. Now in this section here, right below the trinamic section, there are a couple of other things I recommend checking out. So this chopper timing, chopper default, make sure you set this depending on whether you have a 12 volt or a 24 volt printer. As you see here, it's 12 volt by default. You're gonna to wanna to change that to 24 volt if you have a 24 volt printer. And I also recommend right down here to monitor those trinamic drivers for any errors. So if you'll notice right here, it is commented out by default and I take that off so that the monitor driver status is enabled. And I think that's it for everything you're going to need to do specific to this board. Everything else is gonna be very specific to your printer and I will not be covering that here. So let's head over to the printer and see how everything works. Okay, everything's buttoned back up. It's ready to go. As you can see, this is my display and it is really solid still, even though it's missing that one screw. So I'm pretty happy about that. I was a little worried that this now would be wobbly and it's not at all. The way that that goes on there, it sandwiches that front plate. and It does a really good job of still holding that on there, even without that screw post, so that's good. So as you just saw, configured my firmware, which is going to be available in binary format in the description below if you are actually going to make sure all your wiring is exactly the same way I did it. Now, I have that firmware on here named firmware.bin. I'm gonna put that into the motherboard's SD card 
slot, not the SD card slot on the display. That's for flashing the display itself. So I can turn this on. It's going to read that firmware off of there and then it'll boot up. Now I already have used this display. It is in Marlin mode and that's what's going to come up first. So notice I've got my BL touch. It clicks on boot up. That's a good sign. Down here, boots up, says Marlin 2.0.7.2 which is the latest Marlin at the time that I filmed this video. Comes up, shows the correct temperature for the hot end and for the bed, and that's pretty much it. Now at this point, we're going to test to make sure that we can home the printer. That means that all of our axes are working. So we go to motion and we're gonna to go to auto home. Notice it's gonna to go to the back of the machine just like we're used to. And then it's going to come back to the center. Now on a correctly calibrated BL touch or other probe, the probe will be in the middle of the bed now, not the nozzle. So if you're not used to that, that's what you should expect. And as we see now, the BL touch is working correctly. It is homing correctly. Um, now at this point, you can do some other tests on the machine. You can go ahead and heat up the nozzle and the hot end, make sure that that's all working. You can even do other tests such as doing your Z axis auto align. Since we put those on separate Z drivers, then we can actually use the auto alignment, which is built into the firmware. This version of Marlin also has a really nice Z offset wizard that you will find under the configuration menu for Z offset. Use all of that to recalibrate your printer. And then you're going to go through the normal calibration that you would do with a new printer. And that is the E steps, the flow, the retraction, the Z offset, the bed leveling, you know, go through all of those steps as if it were a new printer. Now, if you saved any of your configuration off before you switch boards, you can go into the menu. Now put those old settings in, save your settings. You can also do that via the console if you want to do it that way. Either way, make sure you put those settings back in there. Go through your configuration. That's what I'm about to do right now. Again, I'm going to pull some of those settings in, then start the normal calibration routine that you're going to do on the printer. That's kind of outside the scope of this video. So I'm going to get all of that going. Once I'm happy with the way the printer is set up, then I'm going to start some test prints. We will compare those test prints to the one that I did in a previous video with the silent board that I had in here previously. We'll take a look, see if there's any real difference in performance of the printer. I'm not really expecting there to be, but we at least want to make sure that we're getting prints that are as good as we were getting before. And if we're getting better, that's a plus on top of everything else. So let's get the uh, test prints going. One more thing I wanted to show you real quick is I just did the preheat on here. And as I mentioned, I hooked fan one up to the controller and what just happened was is since I was preheating, I was waiting to make sure that as soon as I hit 50 C or, or just about that, that hot end fan would turn on just as I had set up in the firmware and it did. So don't be alarmed if you don't see your hot end fan on that's working as I expected it to. Now you're just waiting to, before you heat it up, before that hot end fan actually has to cut on, save you a little bit of noise, maybe save you some fan life on that fan. So as I said, once you start heating it up, you should see it turn on. Once it cools down below that 50 degrees Celsius mark, then it should turn off. So just keep an eye on that. So my test prints are done. Let's take a look at the results. Now, if you saw my review of the Micro Swiss Direct Drive Kit that I have installed on this printer now, then you've already seen these blue test prints here because those are the test prints from that review. Now, what I did here is I wanted to see how has that model changed from before the upgrade to after the upgrade. So I printed the exact same G code, but on this new mainboard. And what I found was that the test prints are pretty much identical. While 
there are some obvious differences between the two. I would say that they actually share more similarities than differences. I actually saw the same sort of issues with layer inconsistency that I was seeing before because I still really haven't tuned in this direct drive kit as much as I would like to. Just doing a comparison between the two prints, I would say pretty much that these are identical prints and that the new mainboard hasn't hurt or helped quality at all. Now keep in mind that this was a relatively slow print at 50 millimeters per second, and I really wasn't putting a whole lot of stress on the processor here. And you really aren't going to see a lot of stress on that processor until you go a lot faster. So for example, on the back of the Batman here, I don't see any stuttering or any other issues, whether using the silent board or whether using the new main board. And again, unless I was really trying to go a lot faster or really, really, push my amount of g-code i'm not going to really push that processor i've already shown in previous videos how the 32-bit processor can't handle a lot more g-code but these test prints really don't push that here that's not really what i was trying to show so what's my overall opinion of this board well as you've seen i've done several other videos on skr boards on this channel and this is another skr board that offers a mix of features of other boards like I've covered earlier in this video. It is a really good mix of the SKR V1.4 Turbo, which offers a lot of features and those interchangeable drivers. But if you don't wanna go through all the hassle of installing an SKR V1.4, this gives you the convenience of that SKR mini line that will allow you to install it in a lot more machines without as much modification as the V1.4 Turbo. And as I saw here in my Ender 5 Plus, yes, there was more modification than that Mini E3. I did have to cut that one post and I did have to modify my display mounting bracket, but overall that still wasn't a whole lot of work. If you have a Dremel available and some snips, that was an easy thing to do. And as you can see from the outside, you wouldn't know which board was in that machine. So I'm really happy with the ease of installation and with the performance and features that I'm getting out of this board, I really do think for the mild increase in price that I would probably go with this board at this point over the Mini. And since this board still has that onboard EEPROM and the V1.4 Turbo doesn't, it really wins my prize as the suggested board for most people if they don't mind that little bit of case bashing that they have to do to get this installed. I really do like this board and I do think it's the best all around board in their lineup now. Now let's go ahead and wrap this up. Now, first of all, I do wanna go ahead and let you know that this board was provided by Big Tree Tech for the purpose of this video. They wanted me to go ahead and give the lowdown on this board so that you would have as much information as possible when it came time to choose an upgrade. Now, second of all, if you are looking for anything that I talked about in this video, whether it be hardware or models or firmware, all of those links are in the description. And of course, as I just said, that will go to my firmware, which will match my installation if you don't wanna to have to build your own firmware. And as people have asked me before, well, what if I want the source? What if I wanna make modifications myself? Well, of course, I'm big into open source. And so you can find my GitHub link below that you can also use to modify it yourself, recompile it and go for whatever features that you want. I try to make it as easy and as painless as possible, no matter what solution you're looking for. So look for those in the description below. Now, as always, I wanna go ahead and thank my Patreon supporters. Those folks help this channel keep going with their monthly contributions. And I really, really wanna thank all of them for all they do for this channel. And I also wanna thank those that have just come by, have decided to subscribe, to like this video, to let YouTube know that this is something that people will enjoy. And hey, all of you folks who have made it to the very end of this video to watch this part of it, I really appreciate all of that. So again, thanks for watching and I'm Chris and this has been Kersey Fabrications. I will see you next time.